Okay, we are live here, uh, Women Innovate Mobile's uh, regular women who tech chat here at Grind Spaces in New York. Uh, this we're, Today we're in the fun box, I think, in, uh, uh, <laughs> in the Broadway and, and uh, 40th. Uh, 40th Street. I was going to say 40th Avenue, but that would be somewhere in Chicago, I think. Uh, <laughs> We're distinctly in New York. Very we are New distinctly York. in New York. Um, and we are here with Alyssa Shavinsky. And uh, we're going to just dive right in here. And I think what a lot of people came interested to hear about, uh, the, the white elephant in the room, if you will, is the whole issue of sexism in tech and, of course, the Business Insider article you wrote. But we've talked a lot about this, and I think a great way to um, get into this conversation is a couple of things we just talked about earlier today. The um, uh, hack hackers, and I want to get it right, the hackers and hookers yes, uh, party. Yes, hackers and hoes, which is how we were referring to it earlier. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so that because yes, the hackers and the hackers and hookers, and then the the guy who thought that if you wore high heels, then you must not have a brain. So right. um, you know these two things, as we were talking about, you say are just very indicative of the whole atmosphere of of the attitude toward women in tech. And yes. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your experiences because you obviously you know. We had a similar feeling about it at one point, where it's like you know one of the boys and hey and so whatever. It's just jokes. Who cares? But you've had you know a very different feeling about it, and I just wonder if you could talk about that yeah, particularly in I, relation to. I had COVID. this epiphany uh, with Tit Stare where um, I realized that I didn't have the luxury, or the option of just being a bro anymore, and I couldn't ignore the issues happening. Uh, around me, um, and people ask me like, why was it ever okay? And it's not that sexism was ever okay. It's that I was very, very focused on my own stuff. Like I was focused on working, and uh, I understood that there were issues. I mean, I was experiencing sexism in tech. Like I have been since I came into the industry, um, and I think that's probably true for many women. Um, and worse for younger women, and I was a young woman in tech. Um, but then when Titster happened and it, it overshadowed everything else at the event, I realized that we really just, had to do something about it. Just by way of background, in case anyone who's watching isn't familiar, Titster was a pretend app that a bunch of programmers uh, uh, debuted at um, Tech It was the rest of this titillating app that, that's yes. how they described it. That is actually how they described it on stage at an event that was supposed to be for families. Yes. Um, and I was actually uh, hanging out with some TechCrunch folks uh, at the time, and I got to see uh, their perspective, which was why I was very favorable towards TechCrunch as I discussed this article, was I saw that their intentions were really, really good, that they weren't um, ignorant or misogynistic or sexist. It was simply that... Um, TechCrunch Disrupt has grown so quickly and they needed to just catch up to that. And, and I think that that's acceptable for the first few times that there are incidents like this. I think going forward, uh, big conferences that don't put the right kind of policies in place and don't have the, like, aren't paying attention to this quite actively will experience incidents. Um, I just uh, contacted a news organization I'm fond of to uh, have a press pass for South by Southwest, and part of my pitch was, you know, like it seems unlikely to me that South by will happen without incident. And in the past, um, South by has been, I think, one of the better conferences, but because people are paying so much attention, which is good, um, it's you really, really do need to be very proactive. I think that this raises interesting questions because you have for example, RubyConf, where you have um, the community really speaking out, making it clear that they care about sexism, they care about seeing women in the program. And I uh, called the RubyConf guys, the organizers, who were really, really nice, but clearly um, just like slightly sexist. Like they were really, really nice and they really 
wanted to do the right thing because it's not fun when people yell at you about your conference. <laughs> but it, they didn't have like a native intuitive understanding of how to do it or of why this was a real problem. Like they kept talking about why they would never want to institute quotas because then clearly everyone on stage isn't doesn't deserve to be there. And so that's what's so interesting. Um, but this has been a little bit rambly. I apologize for that. Uh, let, let's get back to where you started with the topical stuff, hackers and hookers and the issue at uh, the reverse pitch event where um, this woman was being criticized for wearing high heels. So the first is that this seems very New York versus Silicon Valley. So the first is like New York, their women are judged very much on their appearance. You know, I am bi-coastal. I'm in one of my New York residences right now. That's another topic. Um, <laughs> I also spend about a third of the month in the valley. And in New York, there are models and just very, fashion is important here, even for women in tech, it's a thing. Um, and it's really tricky because if we're going to be criticized for dressing in a feminine way, well, that's not great because we're going to be criticized if we don't. And so I think that's the most insidious that's the most insidious form of sexism, when there's no way for you to win. I mean, right. it's obviously, I, I'm going to curse, is that okay? You, are you guys going to be offended? Um, okay, I'll keep it family friendly. Yeah, it's I think it's just, it's only for the YouTube, like I don't have a problem with that, but for you, because it's on YouTube, I think there are issues. <laughs> Here now, I don't want to be the new Ted Stare. Um, <laughs> you, you know, it's it's obviously not ideal if women need to become programmers. Like right. obviously if if we need to be men that's not ideal. But it's even worse if we can't be either men or women. Right. Right? Like ideally we should be able to just be people and not be criticized for everything we do, but um, if we're going to be criticized no matter what we do, then that's right. just like get out of the game and explains why people leave. Well, we were we were talking about that before, where it's we're at this weird point where women are being in, women in tech are being judged on the same in the same way that men are, but they're also being judged at the same time as women and how they're dressed. So so it is this this double thing, whereas men are are being judged on this one level. Right, instead women of are judged on so many things. I think that the biggest issue with women in appearance is simply that is is men actually is men being distracted. Like if you're an unattractive woman, then you're judged for being unattractive, uh, and and there's judgment about your competence. Like there 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 is the sense that if you were more competent, you would make yourself more attractive, or you would like doll yourself up more. Uh, and on the other hand, if you are too attractive, then people are distracted and and that's not good either. Um, so I, I, it, it's, it's a really deep-seated problem. I, I think that really comes out in the hackers versus hookers thing. That, that's like the whole virgin whore thing. Like either you're a hacker, like you're a programmer, you're a dude, yeah. Like we're, we're you know, coding and drinking Red Bull and you're probably a guy or we're going to treat you like a guy. Or like you are gender to the point of being like, the ultimate sex object, which is like you're a hooker, we pay you for sex. So that I I read a bit about what the that hacker space that was hosting this event said and they were like, oh it was all in good fun, but like that's the whole problem. Right. It's, it's like it's not fun for me. I get that it's fun for you. That's the point. The point is you thought this was funny, but it's not funny to separate people into either hackers or hookers. Um we're we're already a third of our our way into our time, oh, and we no. have so much other. So, I mean, we could we could talk about this for like hours, um, but we have so many other things that we wanted to cover. I wanted uh, to just jump into you know the the Cliff's Notes version of your background and how you got into tech and why you got into tech. Sweet, yeah, let's do that. Um, I'm going to do like a thirty second rundown. Of <clears throat> High-level background. So, um, 
my mom was a single mom. I never met my dad. She was a really strong woman, and she always told me I could do anything. And so that has been very formative for me. Um, and she never calls herself a feminist, and that also was formative for me. I think that that has something to do with like how I situate myself um, as in this like sort of moderate way. Um, and actually, I spar with my parents a bit now because they're more conservative than me, uh, and and they're very feminist in how they actually live their lives. Like my mother was always a woman in a man's world, um, and taught me to just be whoever I wanted to be. Um, but they they don't want to label themselves. Um, so so that the cliff notes about my growing up. Um, then I went to Williams College. I studied political philosophy. Uh, and Williams was one of the places where the internet was really like being born. Um, so Tripod was one of the top five websites like in, I don't know, 1995 or 96, and that was born out of Williamstown. And so I was in this tiny little town full of all of these programmers and entrepreneurs who'd actually made a bunch of money from an exit at a point in time where that was extremely unusual. Right, right. Um, so my first boyfriend uh, was a programmer who had dropped out of college and he had worked at Tripod, uh, made some money there, and then was part of the next wave of startups. And uh, so I would go and like visit him at his startups. And he introduced me to his friends and that's how I got into tech. I um, applied to be an intern at Geek Corps, which was Ethan Zuckerman's startup. He's director of civic media now at MIT. And we were sending tech geeks to Ghana. Now that was really, like, really bad, like, really wild at the time because we didn't have the infrastructure we have now. So we wanted to get them books and money and supplies, but we couldn't just send it electronically. So I remember packing this enormous suitcase full of O'Reilly textbooks and, like, oh, wow. like physically going to Ghana to deliver them. Like, I didn't go. I went later. Um, and that's how I got my start. That was one of the first like nonprofits that was behaving like a startup, and it was really awesome. Um, and it got me. It, it, I was still in college. It was very formative, um, and it got me started on that. And then uh, I went to Everyday Health. They filed for IPO in 2010, but I was employed like 30, so I set up a lot of the infrastructure at that company. Uh, you know, I was hired and trained by the founders. And I was building software there. And okay. yeah, and what I what I realized is not everyone's had the experience of actually building software in a team that like is doing a good job with it. <laughs> um, and just I fell in love with it. Like just being in a team of people, it's like one in the morning, you're trying to get the code out and you're eating takeout and you just you're trying to get it done and you have the shared goal. And there are very few things in the world that are as much fun to me as that. And I, I ended up starting my own companies just in an effort to re-experience that. I, I think what's really interesting about your background is that, you know, I mean, there's so much talk about STEM education and women in STEM and starting kids on computer programming when they're oh, little. Whatever. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm not downplaying the importance yeah. of that. I mean, that's there's certainly, it, it creates an atmosphere that, that maybe makes things a little different. but. I mean, I'm sorry, you said political philosophy? Yeah, so I, so. I don't mean to say oh, whatever, as in, like, we should not be supporting these things. Right. Like, yes, yes, absolutely. Of course I am all for this. Let's not misunderstand me. I'm easily misunderstood. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's okay. What I mean to say is something inspiring, which is you can bypass all of that. And to be fair, I do have a very strong science background from high school. I went to a science high school. But, um, you know, you can go to a liberal arts college in, you know, the wilderness and read Plato and, like, feminist theory, which is what I was doing, uh, and never code and end up, you know, being great in tech. Um, it's never too late to get started. I think that's a great message. And something I feel like I, I so often run into women who are saying, oh, I wish I'd learned, you know, programming. I wish I'd studied it. And it's just like, well, then do it now. And it's great to see people who <clears throat> didn't, you know, do that from day one necessarily. I mean, yes, you had a strong science background, but it's more the aptitude and the desire that's important. 
Here's the other piece of it, which is really interesting to me. You know, there is a bias towards being a programmer. Uh, and there's the notion that the technical founder is the builder. Uh, I have had many technical founders, and I have always been the builder and the architect and the one who holds the vision. I think with PAX it was different. PAX is uh, at the risk of saying something nice about PAX Dickinson. Like <laughs> He's very special. He wears a lot. He's very capable of doing many, many CEO tasks in a way that's unusual. Um, so we'll set him aside, uh, and I'll speak about all the other, all my other collaborators. For the most part, I've been the one specking things out and making the designs, and you don't need to code for that. Like, yes, at this point, I am quite technical. You know, like I'm, re I'm, I'm very technical, but for a long time I wasn't and I was still contributing to these software projects in a really significant way. Uh, and so that's beyond the scope of this conversation, but it's worth touching on that right. I don't need to code to really contribute a tremendous amount to a software project. You need to uh, download Keynotopia and Keynote and learn UI and talk to users and learn design and like, yes, those are somewhat technical, but it's not the same as, you know, scripting or like writing backend code or like setting up the database. So to to segue from there into some of your earlier uh, projects before before mm -hmm. the the whole NSA thing that you're working on now, which we will definitely get to. Uh, it's really interesting to me your. Um, your projects in in online dating because okay. of the very specific way you were looking at it. And I, I love, maybe we even start off with you talking about the conversation you had with the founder of OkCupid okay yesterday. Oh, yeah. I, had the, <laughs> I had the greatest day yesterday. Um, so I, I went to the SAI 100 party last <laughs> night. That's hosted by Business Insider. I was Pax Dickinson's former plus one. He was on a <laughs> I got to go, which was <laughs> kind of hilarious. And uh, Max Krohn, who was um, the original technical architect for OkCupid, one of the founders, uh, comes over. He's like, I, I know you. Like, how do I know you? I'm like, well, from all this online dating stuff that I've done, we follow each other on Twitter now. And, you know, I was one or two drinks in, and he doesn't work there anymore. Um, and so I made a pretty big confession, and I told him about this gray hat project where I basically hacked OkCupid okay with um, my longtime collaborator, who by the way is also a goat herder in Idaho. Um, and I pay wow. him a thousand dollars a week and he works for me. Um, as long as I pay him a thousand dollars a week, I have a full-time developer all the time. Um, nice. Yeah. So the two of us together, basically we hacked OkCupid okay and we built this spam filter for OkCupid. Okay the reason it's a hack is because um, we I don't know how technical to make it, but basically we wanted okay. to mimic the user to OkCupid. Okay and, and basically it's because they don't have an API that it's it's a hack. Because they don't have an API, and part of my end game with this was to try and persuade them to build an API, and actually I wanted to come in and be the one to build the <laughs> API. That was part of the goal of this. The other goal was to really highlight the difference between how men and women use online dating. So men build online dating for the way that they use online dating, which is to go and search and hunt and find interesting people and then try and conquer them. Um, whereas women, uh, they, they go into their inbox and they see what's there. And online dating, uh, with the exception of the real newcomers, right, like Tinder, Coffee Meets Bagel, they're solving this problem. But for the incumbents who still have a lot of usage, it's not a good experience for women. Women sign on, they get too many hey sexy messages, and they leave. Uh, and it really feels like harassment. Like, I got to a point where I could barely take it, and I was doing this, like, I was going on OkCupid okay professionally for my job, like, as R&D, which gave me some emotional distance. So what I built was a spam filter for your OkCupid okay profile. So uh, you use my service, and we uh, log you into OkCupid, okay and we grab all of your mail, and we download it. And then we filter it for you according to the following criteria. Uh, the first is a grammar check. So which um, I love. I just th I, there are so many people I know who would just love any service that did a grammar check. 
This was um I did I this wasn't my idea. This was like user testing with women. This was from me going into the bathrooms at clubs when women are like <laughs> drunk and being very real. Which by the way is one of the reasons why I thought I had an advantage over men in the industry. Because they yeah. can't do that. And so I got <laughs> an honesty from my target demographic that is highly unusual. And my methods are unusual, but Effective. Um, and so, you know, all these women, um, after a few drinks at these clubs, were very honest about what they wanted, and they wanted a grammar check. Like, okay, <laughs> we did that, and we have a naughty word check. So, um, you know, I was uh, putting together the naughty word check, and by the way, my programmer who I work with all the time is my ex-husband. So we're compiling this naughty word check, and we realize it's incredibly awkward. Because we're like trying to think of all the naughty words we can. <laughs> and then eventually I was like, okay, okay, let's not do it this way. And I found like there are already compiled lists of naughty words. This is like a solved problem. Like Shutterstock, Google, they have it on GitHub. Um, <laughs> then, you know, my ex husband and I stopped trading naughty words back and forth. Very awkward. Um, but hilarious. Um, the, the naughty word, well, I'll stay on topic, but it's very funny to see the things that make it into like Google or Shutter Stocks naughty words. There were things like just God. I'm like, why is God a naughty word? Right? <laughs> um, uh, what else did we do? We filter to make sure that um, your the guys showing up in your inbox actually are like in the ballpark. So mm -hmm. maybe you only want to meet people who are near you. Maybe you only want to pe meet people who are near your age. So a big problem on sites like OkCupid is 50-year-old guys hitting on 18-year-old girls. Right. I would get a lot of messages from people who just were like, in no way appropriate. <laughs> um, they're just the wrong age. Right. Uh, they're too far away. They basically um, saw your picture and thought they'd send you a message that said, hey, sexy. Or what I, yeah, I, I think <laughs> that's just like this hit and run thing. Like It's fun for them. Um, so. Yeah. We called this OK Mail, uh, and I was just really excited about giving women the opportunity to make better use of these mainstream online dating services. Like the, the software we built can scale to Match.com and How About We and these other services. You could check all your mail in one box. I'd have to finish building it. If right. someone decides they want to fund this project, um, <laughs> I would probably be game um, to so keep. So let's talk about why you you haven't been working on this project as much lately because you have a lot of other really interesting the NSA man, the NSA stuff NSA going on. Because <laughs> the NSA has to stop. Um, that's the <laughs> biggest reason why. Like online dating to me is incredibly important. Like it means a lot to me to connect people, and it means a lot to me to protect women from harassment. You know, I think. I've met great people on OkCupid, uh, both for friendship and romantically, and I'd love to be able to experience that site without right. the hey, sexy messages. Right. So I think I've, I've always felt really good about contributing to that space. Yeah. But um, the 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 anti-NSA work just feels so urgent. Yeah, it really does. Like I really need to work on that right now. So um, tell us what what you're doing. I, I mean, both just in terms of project, and then you have. Um, an exciting conference that you're working on. Yeah, so uh, some of it has just been like exploration. Like I met with the EFF to see if they wanted additional plaintiffs. I was uh, very interested in suing the NSA. Um, if, if that was a contribution I could make, but uh, the EFF didn't need any additional plaintiffs. <laughs> and so when you do things without the backing of those kinds of organizations, they don't make as big of an impact, so I'm probably not going to say right. But um, like those are the kinds of things I was exploring. Uh, what I built with PAX and the rest of our team for Glimpse was uh, a service where we would file your Freedom of Information Act paperwork with the NSA. So basically, like the NSA has a lot of information about many US citizens. You have the right to petition them to know what that information is and to delete it. Uh, right. So I built a service doing that. Um, and then did a lot of work architecting Glimpse. And I'm advising that company now. Uh, I'm excited about Glimpse because it's an end-to-end -end encrypted app, so it stops the firehose of data to the NSA. And it's also really fun and whimsical. 
Um, it's still like about connecting people, which I think is great. Oh. And uh, it's about sharing secrets. And some secrets are big and serious, and some secrets are light and whimsical. Right. And I think we should be able to share all of those things. Um, if the government has a warrant, then we are protected. Things so like of course you know the government comes with a warrant, we'll give them the information. But right. in the absence of that, I I am a big believer in the right for citizens to communicate privately. So it's well known that I officially stepped down as CEO, um, but uh, I still have a hand in what they're doing as an advisor. Um, I'm I'm glad to hear that because I mean whatever the the issues were with with working with PAX or what have you. I mean, it's still a great project, and you put a lot of yourself into that. Yeah, uh, everyone who's on it right now, it's like all my team. It's all the people who I brought on. Um, and so, you know, I can't just abandon that. Plus, I really believe in it. I, I really do. I think you look at the security space, and you have these, like, really amazing high security applications, but they're hard to use. And then you look at the stuff that people use because it's easy, like Snapchat, and it doesn't actually provide security. So I'm excited about it. Um, where were we? What else do you want to ask? Um, well, you you did have a conference. Oh, the conference, Troublemakers. Yeah. This is inspired by Jonathan Corbett, who, uh, whose website uses the phrase troublemaker. Um, yeah, so I uh, was really disheartened by all of the issues at these tech conferences, and most notably at DEF CON. And I'd originally been a defender of DEF CON, but I spoke to more of my female friends, and uh, they really experienced tremendous harassment. Uh, one was actually hacked, like ter just very serious stuff happening at these conferences, and I was inspired to try and do an alternative and create a new model. It's not to say that there aren't people out there who are doing conferences that are great, because they are, but mm -hmm. I wanted to do something that was much more directly intended to be what I thought DEF CON should be. Uh, so DEF CON is basically a party for hackers in Vegas, and uh, the DEF CON people defend the use of strippers as part of their programming. Uh, so, you know, you have, like, the RubyConf guys, who won't defend sexism, but like don't natively understand how to really create a welcoming environment. Um, and then you have the DEF CON folks who are like, we've been doing this a long time, and we like it this way. Uh, <laughs> so just as someone who cares about the hacker community, I, and I certainly care about security, um, I wanted to, it seemed to me that Having a professional, welcoming environment should be what's normative. Mm -hmm. It should be normative. And so I wanted to create a conference around the idea that um, a professional conference for hackers should not be so radical or, or crazy. Um, and there are so many people who I really want to highlight who are doing such incredible work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there was this problem that my conference is too broad because the people who I admire and respect uh, as hackers are across too many disciplines. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was chatting with, um, again, some folks at the EFF, and we realized that the one thing that held everything together was they were all troublemakers. <laughs> so Jonathan Corbett was one of the first speakers who said, uh, yes, you know, come and he'll speak. And he is uh, this big TSA hacker. He actually proved that the body scanners don't work. Um, that you, you can smuggle a gun through the body scanners and they're not making us more safe. And then uh, he filed something with the t with with the government, and uh, one of the clerks messed up, and uh, some of the sealed documents became unsealed. And so Jonathan Corbett is responsible for revealing uh, that um, the government actually knows that the hijacking of planes is not like a very serious threat. Right. Um, but they're stating that that's the reason why we have the body scanners. So he's a great example of the kind of troublemaker I wanted to highlight. But he's like an activist. Uh, and then you've got Gene Hoffman. He's really the leading Second Amendment hacker in the country, a total troublemaker, often behind the scenes. Um, and then Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch, who writes about the NSA. Um, so I was like, well, what do all these guys have in common? And I'm obviously working to bring on more, like, people who aren't these, like, white dudes. 
Um, right. <laughs> that's very important. So uh, there are a number of people helping out with that. I've got uh, Riley, who's a Teal Fellow, um, and she's connecting me to like women at MIT. Um, and then I'm obviously trying to reach out more to people of color. I grew up in Queens, so it shouldn't be that hard. But, <laughs> um, we have. We have one question from uh, from the audience, and actually, just before I, I ask that, I wanted to say um, when we do the wrap up on this talk, um, Alyssa, if you can send me information on how people can get involved in any way um, with the conference, um, and also some of the resources you were talking about, like Kino and Kinotopia, um, then then we can include that in the wrap up. But um, this was a really interesting question, um, and it really is is right up your alley. Considering how much technology, it's from Holly Lynch, considering how much technology actually reveals about us in terms of big data collection, what is the role of tech makers in protecting people? Oh, that's so interesting. That's a great question. I think that technologists have a choice. Uh, they can choose to stand up to the government or they can choose to work closely with them. So. Uh, the folks behind Google, for example, work very closely with the government. That's a choice that they've made. Uh, the folks who run Silent Circle, um, who are a bunch of cryptographers and take you know, privacy and private communications very seriously, have chosen to architect their privacy policy as well as their actual technology in such a way that um, users' privacy is extremely, extremely protected. So when I was architecting a Glimpse, I met with John Callis, who's the CTO of Silent Circle, and uh, one of basically one of the world's best practical cryptographers, um, like just a total, like really, really nice person. And he said, "Look, if you architect your privacy policy in a way that protects your users' data, uh, and you back that up um, by building your app in such a way that it's you know encrypted and and the data is secure." then the government can't force you to change that. You know, you, you get to stand behind the policy you make to your users. Um, and so it's just a choice that technologists are making. Do they want to monetize users' data? There's a lot of money to be made there. That is the dominant business model for major social networks. Um, if you're going to choose a different direction, you need a monetization strategy where users aren't the product. You need to figure out how you're going to monetize your own premium content or um, premium features, and, and that can be challenging. It, it's just a choice, um, and and any technologist can do this. You know, I'm not very special for having made this choice, right? Like there are a lot of technologists who know more about legal stuff than I do, or know more about technology than I do, right? Like I'm sure the people behind Google and Facebook have more resources than I do to take these things on, but um, like I'm willing to leave the country, right? Like mm -hmm. that's not, that, that is not an issue for me. Of course I'm willing to leave the country before I would violate users' privacy. So you need to be willing to make certain personal sacrifices if you're going to really take on the government. Right. Well, I've, I have a feeling this is another topic that we could probably talk about for like two days, um, but we're we're already ran over a little bit just because it was such a great conversation. So I wanted to thank you so much for spending this time with us today, uh, and and our previous chats leading up to this. And uh, I'd like to thank our audience for coming in and Grind for hosting us here today. And uh, with that, I think we'll wrap up. Amy, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to everyone who listened in. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me over Twitter. My Twitter handle is Alyssa Beth. Amy, is there a way to type that in and share that with people? Um, yeah, we will. We will uh, put that on the event page and then also um, in the wrap up as well. We'll include okay, a follow button there. Awesome! Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Bye.